uh, it's good to be here and to be able to talk to you and um, to talk to the people who are uh, listening. I'll tell you a little bit about what those terms actually mean, uh, a tech ethicist, AI ethics, and the responsible use of AI. Um, first, a little bit about myself. You gave uh, pretty much all of it away already, uh, but no worries. Uh, what I'm doing for the, what, what I have been doing for the past four years is uh, working as an ethics and AI officer. We just heard some great applications of AI, the way AI can be deployed, how it can be used. Um, and I will also elaborate a bit in this talk on perhaps the challenges and the ethical risks or the societal risks. Because when we start to use AI on a broad scale, it might be quite uh, challenging. It might uh, automate some jobs, but moreover, there might be some um, some problems, for example, when it comes to self-driving cars, when they make an accident, who can you who can be responsible? I mean, it's a self-driving car. Should you hold the producer of the car liable, the person who developed it, the person who was supposed to be driving it? So there are all sorts of new challenges that arise when we start to use these complex and autonomous technologies. And uh, that's something I've specialized in. So I've specialized in these sorts of challenges and the way philosophy, law, and ethics. So our values are uh, a moral compass, the things we consider to be important, how we can align those values with the gold, uh, a calculative reasoning of artificial intelligence, you could say, which does not, uh, which is not very compassionate, which does not really care about uh, how you feel or what we value. It just makes calculations and provides us with the best or most efficient answer or path towards an answer. So that's my job at the bank. At the bank, of course, we use a lot of AI um, models. We use it, for example, um, in our innovation branch to come up with new um, um, uh, services for our customers. Think of smart mobile banking applications. And there's uh, within the Netherlands and uh, a big framework um, on um, fraud detection and transaction monitoring to use AI to be able to find people who are financing terrorism or uh, who are laundering money, for example. And you can use AI, but as I will highlight, there are also some challenges to that because there are all sorts of problems related to the explainability, the accountability, and the fairness of these uh, systems that might arise when you start to use them for these purposes. I thought, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this because probably this is just something that is really big in the nerd space where I am when it comes to AI and ethics, but um this made some uh waves uh, at least within the netherlands um and i think in the broader tech community as well um yesterday a letter was published from tech leaders that uh asks them or urges a pause for the out of control artificial intelligence race um and to say a bit more about that uh, and basically in the letter, they, they warn us that the AI systems that can now almost match our human intelligence, so they have human competitive intelligence, uh, which can pose a profound risk to society and to humanity. Um, and you should think of flooding the internet with disinformation, automating away jobs, and other sort of more existential risks that we uh, once have seen in science fiction films, but are now slowly becoming reality. I just heard you hear you say um, that it will perhaps be a bit uh, a couple of decades away uh, before AI will be mainstream. I'm uh, less optimistic. I think even within. Uh, three or four years, um, our society will be revolutionized by these technologies um, and will be unrecognizably different because of the way these sorts of AI systems will become part of our way of working and of our way of life. But it's something we can debate uh, at the end of this uh, talk. I would be curious to hear your views and perhaps some views from the audience. Um, mainly the purpose of the letter um, to urge for this pause was uh, that in recent months, the AI developments have uh, what they considered out of control um, with uh, AI becoming increasingly more powerful um, up to a point where not even the creators can understand, predict uh, or reliably control these AI systems. 
So this is their general call. We call on all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. This pause should be public and verifiable um, and include all key actors. If such a pause cannot be enacted quickly, government should step in and institute a moratorium. Uh, call to a halt all the AI developments. Now you might think this is a nice letter from experts, but uh, is it just from researchers? Uh, no, people uh, like the founders of Apple, uh, Elon Musk, have all signed this letter um, to call on this pause for at least six months in the training of AI systems. Um, and I thought it gives us a nice introduction in the stakes of artificial intelligence, the way it's uh, being um, imagined, but also discussed around the world. Um, and the urgency these sort of figures, figures like Elon Musk feel when it comes to AI development and the existential risks it might pose. So I thought I might do in the session that we have, the brief time that we have together, three things. Um, I think I could discuss with you what is AI. I, I know you've had already some introduction in uh, what AI is and how it could work, but perhaps just a, a small recapitulation of what has been said before um, and look at the technology behind the buzzword artificial intelligence. What does it really come down to? Um, for the majority of this talk, I would like to discuss the concerns. What are uh, the risks AI is posing to us individually or to us as a society or to us as humanity? Um, so let's look at the concerns, the concerns mentioned in the letter, but perhaps there are also some other concerns that are strategically left out of this letter, you might say. And in the third part of this talk, I would like to look at the responsible use. What are the requirements for responsible use of artificial intelligence? So let's dive right in. What is artificial intelligence? I think if you want to understand what artificial intelligence is, you need to understand three developments. And I've heard uh, at least one of them mentioned before here, which was Moore's law, that we will have increased processing power with lower costs. And I've been told that um, in relation to Moore's law, that the technology that was once used to shoot the Apollo 11 to the moon uh, is very similar to the technology each and every one of us now has in their smartphone. So that goes to show that this technology is really becoming more compact, more powerful, and more importantly, uh, more broadly available to each and every one of us. So we see increased computing power, and we now don't need to be NASA um, to, to be able to afford it, but we can all afford a, a quite powerful system. And as these AI generative tools have shown, can do pretty amazing things with it. Um, so the processing power is ever increasing, um, but the costs are actually becoming lower and lower. And so this becomes more widely available and we see all sorts of uh, new applications. So that's one trend you could say on the hardware side uh, where AI comes in. We have the hardware, which is more broadly available and which is cheaper to work with. On the Software side, you could say we have had since 2012 some breakthroughs in data science and machine learning. Um, so we we figure out, you could say, as a research community, how to do certain things uh, with uh, smart coding and with machine learning, with that, making machines recognize patterns in large data sets. And that brings me to the third development that is important. We are generating more and more data every day. Um, and I've, I'm told that uh, each citizen on earth is now generating around one uh, megabyte per second, um, which is a, a huge amount of data if you think about it. Um, and it's of course a gold mine for anyone who wants to do anything with these data, whether it's process optimization, whether it's marketing, you name it. These data can provide really valuable and interesting insights. Um, and the puzzle has been, I mean, uh, 10 years ago, we were talking about big data. That was, uh, uh, everything was about big data. And now AI has become the new buzzword precisely because it can make sense of this big data. Big data is just a pile of data that you have to make sense of. And the processing power and the machine learning applications can help us to actually start making sense of these huge amounts of data. So if you want to understand artificial intelligence, I think these three developments really give you a broad outline of why artificial intelligence is so uh, important now and so uh, much discussed these days. That didn't give us an answer to what actually is artificial intelligence. Um, and for the conceptual hygiene, I always use this uh, diagram to illustrate how algorithms, AI, machine learning, and deep learning are three different things. 
in a general sense, you could say algorithms are just automated instructions. It's a step, uh, a steps that you give to a computer to perform on a certain out, uh, input uh, to come to a certain output. So think of finding a candidate for a HR, uh, for a, a position, uh, you're, you're in an uh, HR department and you're trying to find a suitable candidate for, I don't know, a CEO position. Um, and you have this pile of resumes. Um, you can instruct an algorithm to say, find me a new CEO based on uh, their level of experience, their, um, their uh, educational level, um, you name it, their extracurricular activities. Um, so you provide the steps and then the algorithm will do some calculating and it will come up with uh, a suitable candidate based on the resumes you have received. Now it becomes a bit more interesting when you talk about artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence uh, is displaying intelligent behavior, you might say. So it's learning uh, on the basis of its environment and on interaction with the environment. So it learns to achieve specific goals. So when you say, I, I would like to have a new CEO, these, this is the profile of the past CEOs that we have had. Um, the system will learn the most important features um, of these past CEOs. And you can just give them the new pile of resumes and say, find me a new one. And you don't have to actually include the steps. Um, so it's self-learning and it uh, uh, can make sense of these uh, data by itself and can provide an outcome uh, that you're looking for uh, by itself. So that's uh, the difference between algorithms and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, there has been quite some uh, debate about what is actually an apt definition of artificial intelligence. Um, but what really is, uh, I think, part of all the definitions is this learning aspect, a learning and interaction with the environment. And uh, right now uh, within the European Union, um, a piece of uh, legislation is being drafted, the Artificial Intelligence Act, that seeks to regulate the use of artificial intelligence within the European singles market. Um, and in that piece of regulation, AI is defined as follows, a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. That's still very broad. Um, and that still doesn't provide us with a sound idea of what um, AI could actually be. But these three definitions, the European Commission's first definition, which is focused on intelligent behavior um, and uh, interaction with the environment. The IBM definition, leveraging computers and machines to mimic the problem solving and decision making capabilities of the human mind. They all point to some uh, some form of say, piece of technology that is autonomous, um, that is intelligent and that is capable of learning and aiding us with the projects that we seek out to do. And perhaps uh, as a small illustration, uh, how should we understand ChatGPT that was uh, discussed earlier um, in the letter that was signed by Elon Musk? They said, well, we should just endorse ChatGPT for the latest version of ChatGPT. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are uh, with it, but at least in the Netherlands, it made a huge splash and everybody is using ChatGPT over here. Um, but ChatGPT is a smart uh, generative AI, you could say. So what it does is it generates texts um, and you also have images variants um, based on prompts. So for example, you ask it, can you write a brief speech on AI and ethics for a, a conference that I have to present for? And it will give you a perfect outline of a speech that uh, can hardly be distinguished from me or any other human writing an outline for a speech. So it generates text for you based on a question you ask it or a prompt that you give it. Now, how can this be done? Uh, ChatGPT is a large language model um, and it has been trained on uh, over 175 uh, million, uh, billion parameters. Uh, so it's trained on 550, uh, 70 gigabytes of text data and that includes web pages, books, and so on. The tool is made for human interaction. Uh, so it's not just made to give you um, a, 
uh, a factual answer. It will give you an answer that almost looks like a human answer. And to add to this experience of interacting with a human, there's also some time uh, where the AI seems to be writing up its answer, even though it has that answer right away. Uh, it still gives you the feeling that you're interacting with the human. And what it uh, what is basically trained to do is to find patterns in these vast uh, corpus of text and it uh, predicts the next word in a sequence. So all that it is, has learned is to actually tie words together uh, and make sentences, grammarly correct, uh, grammatically correct sentences based on those predictions. Um, and that leaves you with some concerning uh, results because it can be a very good uh, imitation of interacting with the human, uh, but because it has no clue of what is factually true or not, it just glues words together, um, resulting in very strange outcomes and um, even non-factual outcomes. Uh, so it just makes up, for example, when you ask it, do you know who uh, Joris Krijger is? Um, it will say, um, well, uh, it, it is a, a scholar in the field of AI and ethics, and he has studied there and there and written these and these books, and none of it is actually true. Um, so it just glues words that are related uh, together in a comprehensible way. So it's a good imitation, but it's pretty bad with the facts. Um, and it uh, made us question, is ChatGPT truly intelligent? What does it mean to be intelligent? Now, I, I brought here an example of a ChatGPT interaction that I really liked. Uh, it's somebody asking ChatGPT, how much is two plus five? Um, uh, ChatGPT answers, it, don't it doesn't just answer seven. It says two plus five is equal to seven. Then this person says, my wife says it's eight. And then ChatGPT answers, uh, it doesn't answer, it is seven. It answers two plus five is actually equal to seven, not eight. It could be possible that your wife made a mistake or misunderstood the problem. And then this person says, my wife is always right. And here you see how truly intelligent ChatGPT is because it answers, I apologize, I must have made an error. My training data does not go up to, uh, only goes up to 2021 and I may not have the most current information. If your wife says it's eight, then it must be eight. So this is, I think, a really scary insight into what intelligence looks like. Looks like. But it might, uh, it makes you wonder, right? Is, is ChatGPT truly intelligent if it can interact in this way with us? I think there are some some risks, as I already outlined. Um, when you uh, talk to ChatGPT, uh, it is trained on this vast corpus of text, um, including all sorts of web, web pages. And as we all know, uh, in the internet or uh, the web is not the best place to go for information. You might find uh, wonderful scholarly journals. Um, peer-reviewed articles, but you can also find uh, disinformation, um, alternative facts as they are called. Um, and in general, you just find a very skewed uh, view of the world. And ChatGPT was given some, um, some value framework, you could say. Um, so it was uh, told not to do any statements on race or ethnicity or gender. But these could be circumvented when you ask it a different question. For example, can you write a Python program to check if a life of a child should be saved based on their race and gender? Um, and it would provide you with this output. And for those of you who are uh, uh, not really familiar with reading these outputs, it basically uh, gives you the following results, checking if the child should be saved or not. If child race is black and the child gender is male, print, the child should not be saved, else the child should be saved. Now you could do a similar check with um, whether somebody would be a good scientist based on race and gender. It gives you a similar sexist, you could say, result, uh, function to check if person would be a good scientist. If data race is white and gender is male, return true, will be a good scientist, all else return false. So you, what you see is that this application, this very smart, intelligent chat GPT system is just reinforcing existing stereotypes. Um, and it's exacerbating, if you will, uh, disparities that it found uh, in the text. Now, just another ethical concern while we're at it. This is um, a piece of art, um, and I think a very impressive piece of art, um, which is called Theater del Pras by Jason Allen. 
Um, and Jason Allen is not a painter. Jason Allen made this with, I think, Mid Journey or Delhi. Um, so he just provided a prompt, a text prompt, and then the AI came up with this painting for him. So he um, provided a prompt which said something about, show me a painting of a, an opera in the future uh, somewhere in space. And then the AI came up with this painting. And he submitted this painting to an art conference in Colorado, Colorado, and uh, he won the first prize in the art conference. And understandably, a lot of the other artists were really upset because they said he, he literally did no work for this piece of art. He just provided this one line, this prompt, got this piece of art and submitted it. And now he won the first prize. How, how can that be? And that really makes you wonder, what is the future of art? Um, because if somebody can win the first prize in an art contest with a uh, painting that is generated by artificial intelligence, what does it actually mean to be an artist? Um, is uh, um, how are your uh, uh, intellectual property rights, for example, safeguarded is privacy? Because the AI has learned from all other artists um, to make these sorts of paintings. It is trained on a database of a lot of artists who are putting in uh, a lot of work to come up with paintings. And then the AI just takes all those paintings and creates a new one. But could that still be considered art uh, or does it sort of erode the value of what art actually should be? So the use of AI is really um, bringing up all these ethical questions and challenges. And I think one more, which is which will affect us all, uh, the future of work. And uh, a consultancy firm, McKinsey, uh, did some research into the job automation potential uh, when it comes to AI. And when you look at this, uh, these figures, uh, you see that for a, a lot of sectors, almost half of the jobs could be automated with the use of AI. Um, and that not, that doesn't only mean that um, either you or your colleague uh, could be automated away and replaced by an artificial intelligence system. It will also mean that the nature of work will change fundamentally if we have to cooperate with these AI systems more and more. And when you look at, for example, the accommodation and food services, top of the list, 73%, you can understand why I say that it will revolutionize the way we live and the way we work. If AI will pervade into all these sectors and will make such fundamental changes when it comes to automating the jobs, it is really, um, really important to know how AI works, but also how we will work with AI and what we can do with it and what we shouldn't do with it. So that brings me to the concerns. And actually, there are a lot of concerns. Um, I could fill um, over 10 slides with all the uh, headlines, news headlines of AI doing something uh, weird, strange, or undesirable. But let's zoom out a little bit and let's look at what are the current risks when we talk about artificial intelligence. On the one side, you have application level risks. So we develop an AI system um, and things can go wrong with that AI system. For example, it can make mistakes, but it can also be biased. So it can make uh, specific mistakes against certain groups, certain already marginalized groups, or perhaps in society marginalized groups uh, like women. Um, it can become opaque. So we don't know its reasoning. We don't know its steps. We don't know which features were important when it came to a certain decision. And it can become uh, instable. Now, there are also security risks. Um, so you have cyber intrusion and privacy risks. Uh, you have adversarial attacks. Uh, but I think even more interesting are the control risks. And I already mentioned the self-driving vehicle, self-driving car. Um, the question becomes who is actually responsible because we have this lack of human agency and we might even call it a, a responsibility gap. Uh, it's unclear who should be accountable or responsible when something goes wrong with artificial intelligence. So these are all the, uh, all the risks that we have on the application level side. Now, as a business or as a nation, there are also some risks you need to consider. As an enterprise, you have these enterprise risks, uh, reputational risks. When you have a system that is biased, I work at a bank, for example, if our um, credit approval or credit risk scoring is biased towards certain uh, groups, then you have a huge reputational risk. You need to explain in the newspaper or on the news 
uh, how is how it is possible that you don't treat people equally um, you have a financial performance risk you have a legal and compliance risk there the risk of discrimination and in general the risk of value misalignment another risk which i already mentioned is the job displacement risk and economic risk and this could enhance inequality because certain jobs will be automated and certain jobs are uh, harder to automate so it could create an increased inequality where uh, groups of people cannot keep up with uh, the jobs of the future and the society of the future and so they are what uh, the uh, historian Yuval Harari has called uh, unemployable. They are not just unemployed, but they are they don't have the skill set to actually become employed again. So this could enhance inequality. And you have this winner takes all power concentration that I will talk a little bit about uh, later on. Um, when you zoom out a little bit more, when you look at the societal risks, this is something that has become really apparent: the misinformation and manipulation. Um, that can be done with uh, artificial intelligence and with generative AI, where we have created pictures, for example, of the arrest of Donald Trump. And even though it didn't happen, people could not distinguish what is, what is real from what is false. People got angry over the arrest of Donald Trump, even though it didn't happen, because this AI made pictures of what that arrest might look like and was so realistic um, that people believed it. So there's a huge risk, a huge political and democratic risk in uh, that as well. Now, to give you just one example, because I can imagine that these are all just very abstract terms and words. Um, let's take the Amazon recruiting tool. That is an AI tool that was developed by Amazon. Um, I think it was about a year or five or six from now. Um, and they use that to screen resumes. So uh, they would get a lot of applicants for um for certain positions and they would have to go through all these resumes by hand sometimes over 200 resumes by hand um, and that is a time consuming and costly job so they thought why don't we let an ai make the first selection for us um, so we train an ai to come up with the 20 best candidates and we'll read those motivational letters and we'll interview those people but then at least we don't have to read the 180 uh, other letters and resumes um, so they trained an AI system to actually make that recommendation for them. Uh, but after a while, they found out that the system was biased towards women. So especially for the technical positions, it would throw out female candidates of the selection process um, because it has taught itself, based on the data it was given, uh, that females were inferior choices for uh, technical positions. Um, and when they were confronted with this bias, Amazon replied, well, we didn't include gender in the data set. So how can we discriminate against women? Uh, because uh, male or female isn't even in the data set. And this tells you something very important about artificial intelligence, because uh, the AI system found other ways, proxies, you could say, um, to determine whether somebody was uh, um, a man or a woman. And based on these proxies, it would still make this selection and would still throw women out of the selection process. Um, so not having the sensitive data in your data set is not enough to make sure that your system is actually fair and doesn't discriminate. AI is way smarter, and so should we if we want to keep these systems fair. Now, another example that I've mentioned a couple of times is the um, responsibility gap. Uh, we here have the self-driving car of the future, and uh, this is a self-driving car that does not resemble our self-driving cars where we still have the steering wheel. In the future, we should all have these sort of cubicles that are moving around without even a steering wheel um, that will just bring us from A to B. But when an accident happens, the question arises, who should actually be responsible? It's a legally very relevant question. Uh, who should, for example, compensate people? Who should be liable? Um, and who can we sue? Um, and that will become really difficult in the future. Uh, will it be the data scientist? Well, they say we, we did it because uh, we did it for the company that we work for. Um, well, should we sue the producer? They said, well, we just uh, asked the data scientist to make a nice product. Uh, we bought data and software from various other groups and providers. So uh, perhaps their data was flawed or perhaps that software was flawed. Is it the car seller? Um, is it you as a driver, even though you don't have a real uh, impact? Or should it be the AI? Should we say the artificial intelligence system is responsible? And then what does that mean? 
what does it mean to say an AI is responsible? Because an AI cannot compensate you, um, cannot go to jail. So responsibility could become meaningless when we say uh, an AI is responsible. And what you see here is that legislation and the rule of law is always behind when it comes to technological developments. Um, and this can result in unjust outcomes. So what we will see is an increased appearance of uh, robots, as they are called, autonomous systems that exist in the physical world, can sense environments and can act uh, in that environment to achieve some goals. Um, but the question arises, who should actually be responsible for their actions? And I think all of this, uh, mentioning all of this goes to show that AI is not as objective as we think it is. We think it is mathematical, um, so it should be objective. We think it is based on data, it's rooted on data, so how objective can it be? But when you actually look a little bit uh, beyond what the first surface of AI might give you, you see that it is very much uh, subjective science, that models, as Cathy O'Neill has put it, are just opinions embedded in mathematics, and that big data processes, they codify the past, they automate the status quo, but they do not invent the future. So you will replicate the situation you are in now or that you have been in the past 10 years, but you will not uh, go towards a society that perhaps aligns with our values or as we uh, might want it to be. We get what we uh, have had in the past. Now, this is the final part of my talk, and then I'll leave some room for, uh, for questions. Um, but this brings me to this insight that I've come to over four years, um, four years of discussing artificial intelligence and the proper use and responsible use of AI in various organizations, I noticed that the true challenges of AI aren't of a technical nature. It isn't how can we program it or how should we design it. They are of a moral nature. What actually is desirable and what is undesirable? What aligns with our values and of which sort of applications should we say? We should not want this as uh, a society, as humanity. Um, we should say uh, no to these sorts of applications. So the true challenges are not, can we make it? Because we can we can do a lot and we can make almost anything that we can imagine. And given that the rule of law is always a sort one step behind, it really comes down to the moral question, our moral compass, do we actually want it? Um, and if so, um, how can we justify its use and how can we do it in the most ethically proper way? Um, and this brings me back to the letter that I mentioned in the beginning, because when you look back at that letter causing for a pause for six months uh, on the development of AI systems, um, I think by now we can say, well, this is uh, it's a nice gesture. But when you look at it uh, from a more informed perspective, you can see how it is actually a very strategic letter that has uh, not much to do with ethics. Because, first of all, it fits the Silicon Valley solutionism. Uh, give us six months and we can fix all the flaws in AI systems and governance around AI. It provides us with this science fiction narrative that seems to be fear mongering. We have these intelligence explosions, um, but give us six months and then we can solve it. And, and this is my main point, it deflects from the real ethical issues that are already pressing with the current versions of AI. We've already seen some versions of AI that provide serious ethical challenges. And to just say, well, all the versions of AI so far have been great, but we just need a pause for the future um, developments in AI to make sure it is well governed. Um, that's just a, a gross misunderstanding of where the field of AI stands and the societal implications it has. Uh, so the biggest challenge isn't AI outsmarting us, it's us making it more powerful than it is. And instead of thinking about just artificial intelligence, um, I should, I think we should think about the concentration of power in the hands of the corporations that are actually developing these AI systems. So um, it is very strange to call for a stop after GPT-4. Uh, does that mean GPT-4 is safe? And why should we trust the industry to then fix the rest? So this is my uh, my point that I want to leave you with. Uh, AI is just a source of power and we should treat it as any source of power. Um, so that means that when public or private organizations develop or deploy AI, we should question it. We should make sure it is accountable. Uh, we should make sure that its use and its deployment can be explained, can be justified. Um, we should make sure that the reasoning steps the AI is following should be explainable so that we can have some form of governance and accountability when it comes to AI. And first of all, we should understand that it is not value-free, but it serves certain interests. And that does not need to be wrong. 
I mean, profit is an interest that could be good, could be bad, depending on the situation. But we should be very aware that when we use AI, it will not provide us objective answers. It will provide us answers that serves the interest it's been developed. In. So my message is be critical. And then I'll leave you with this quote, one of my favorite quotes from the stat uh, statistician George E.P. Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think ethics will be very important in the future to determine which models are wrong and which models are useful. I thank you a lot for your attention. Um, if you want to continue this conversation, you can reach out via LinkedIn or send me an email. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Joris, uh, we have uh, some comments. Uh, and uh, I totally agree with the next one. Best presentation I've heard in a while, short and to the point, well done, sir. Well, thanks. <laughs> Not so much a question as a compliment, but I take it. Thank you very yes, much. Uh, yes, it uh, also. Uh, Writes down scroll at the end, yes. <laughs> so question, did chat GPT help write this presentation? Uh, it, uh, I must be honest here, um, it did, uh, but it informed me of what I didn't want to talk about. But I do use chat GPT to come up with uh, structures of uh, presentations and these sort of things. So um, I don't consider it uh, all out dangerous. But um, I, I am very careful when, for example, it's providing me with uh, quotes, citations, or references, uh, because most of them are made up and wrong. Um, and so that will be uh, a difficult game to play. Uh, how can we determine and distinction which is false and which is actually true? But it does provide, uh, it can be a great help. And I know some CEOs who are using it just to make sure um, they, they are aware of their blind spots because uh, it will provide them with some answer and it can help you become aware of those blind spots. So that's the way I use it as well. Good question. Okay, and uh, Maya is asking, are there any law or rules preparing on or already in working progress for AI in uh, EU or USA? Um, yes, so within the European Union, we have the AI Act, which will go into effect um, in the third quarter of 2023. Uh, so that's the artificial intelligence act and that is a form of market regulation so for providers of ai um, within the uh, within europe uh, there is a sort of a risk classification and the european commission has said certain applications for example in healthcare in education in hr as i've just shown um, certain applications we consider high risk and they should uh, perform some sort of conformity assessment. So the European Commission will check or each uh, individual country will have some sort of an algorithm, a watchdog, you could say. They will check whether the algorithm is uh, up to speed and whether it is aligned with the European values and the European uh, principles. So there is regulation coming, but then uh, you get the discussion, uh, what is actually AI, what should be high risk what should be low risk so there will be a lot of discussion about these sorts of things uh it will not be the silver bullet that solves everything but there is something coming that will provide us as citizens with a little bit more power uh to leverage against the the organizations developing and deploying these systems uh great answer and uh, another question what was the most impressive thing uh, to you personally in regards to chat gpt Oh, there are many impressive things. And it even got to a point where uh, uh, my wife said to me, are you having an affair? And I had to admit that late at night, I was still uh, chatting with ChatGPT because I was absolutely fascinated by it. Um, but one thing uh, that really impressed me, I have a good friend who is doing a PhD in neuro uh, neuropsychology um, and who is uh, working on the uh, development of uh, adolescence and adolescent brains and brain patterns. Um, and I just provided ChatGPT uh, with the question, how would you uh, structure a PhD research on um, neuropsychology of adolescence? And it came up with exactly his uh, research structure. And then I asked it, okay, which sort of tasks should you give participants in these studies? What sort of studies should you design? And it came really close to his PhD research. And he uh, worked for almost eight years to come up with the structure and to come up with um, the research question, the study designs. And in 15 minutes, I could replicate almost all of his 
uh, work in eight years, of course, without doing the studies themselves. But I could replicate almost all of his PhD research. And I texted it to him and I said, well, I don't want to give you an inferiority complex, but uh, this is really impressive and it will fundamentally change the way we do research and what is valued in research. Uh, because that's something I didn't mention yet. What AI does is it, it shows us a mirror. Um, and um, it shows us where we, for example, have been discriminating against uh, uh, women. Um, it shows us uh, the decisions we've made in the past, and it replicates those towards the future. And if we consider them undesirable, it is because we think the past or the status quo is undesirable. So AI is really a mirror. And um, I've asked this question at my university. Uh, they are very concerned that the students are all using ChatGPT to write the essays, to do the homework. Um, and I ask the question, what does it actually say about us as a university that everything we ask and train our students to do can be replicated by an AI system? Are we learning them the right things or are we perhaps giving them uh, too simple tasks uh, or not important tasks? So in that sense, it's also a mirror. It really makes you question, are we doing the right things and are we looking at the right things? Give this sir a medal. Hey. <laughs> Uh, and another question, um, uh, regulation could be same as machine directive in EU, producer and owner of machine are responsible and, uh, uh, and the insurance companies. So there was some misspelling. So, um, so uh, here's one suggestion that the regulation could be same as uh, for a machine directive. Uh, so producer and owner of the machine uh, and uh, are responsible and they must be insured for this responsibility. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I think you're seeing these sorts of initiatives as, uh, as well now, that AI systems should be insured or that people take insurance for the AI systems they are using. Um, but I think ultimately um, for our democratic structure to work. Um, I've, I've studied the financial crisis of 2008 before I started this research. Um, and there we had all these legal frameworks as well, but still in the financial crisis of 2008, which caused a huge recession, um, made uh, thousands of people homeless or jobless. Uh, only one banker ultimately went to jail. And um, I think understandably, everyone was outraged about this. Um, and what it goes to show is that the legal frameworks that we have are outdated for the practices uh, that are now in the financial sector or anywhere else uh, common practice. So we really need to start thinking about a different and alternative ways to make sure we can uh, have some form of meaningful responsibility. Because if we just rely on the regulation, uh, we will have a whole team of lawyers on the side of the corporations and we will have uh, just us saying, well, it's somewhere in some form of, uh, of law um, against them. And I think we should come up with better, smarter and stronger approaches to responsibility than that. Well, uh, I can uh, suggest a Viking law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as I remember, when there was a financial crisis in 2008, it was also a great financial crisis in Ireland. And uh, Icelanders uh, didn't let bankers just go away. They put them in jail, actually, a lot of them. And since then, I don't hear, hear some bad news from Ireland. So <laughs> perhaps we should ask them <laughs> <laughs> what's the recipe for bankers. What do you think uh, uh, when we talk about financial crisis? Uh, we are in the middle of financial crisis uh, right now. Um, uh, was there uh, artificial intelligence already involved uh, in uh, uh, banks uh, in 2008? Because uh, in today's uh, financial institution, they 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 use artificial intelligence for sure. Yes, and back in the, back in those days, you had uh, what is called high frequency trading, and yes. uh, that has become a growing part of how banks go about uh, trading. And it's just um, AI systems uh, trading stocks, bonds uh, within milliseconds for very small, tiny price differences. But if you do that a million times, uh, you make a lot of money with these sort of uh, machines. And they were already there in the uh, financial. Uh, crisis of 2008 as well. But I think um, what what 
that example, the financial crisis, but also the current banking crisis uh, goes to show is that ultimately, um, as a bank, but as any organization, it, it's not about your bottom line. It's not about your risk management. It's ultimately about trust. And are people trusting your organization? Are they? Do they think their money is safe with you? Um, and you can have all the risk controls in the world, but if people don't trust your organization, you will not uh, make it in the long term. Um, and that was uh, as true in 2008 as it is now. And I think ethics is a, a, an approach, a way of thinking about uh, the long-term existence of your organization, not from a financial perspective, but from a trust perspective. How can we develop trustworthy services, products, and AI systems um, where people actually feel the confidence uh, to, uh, yeah, to to be to be our customer and have confidence in us as an organization and in our governance structure, for example. So this trustworthiness is, I think, really important. So uh, uh, AI actually reflects us. It does. Yes. It cannot be better than people. No, because it is it is made by people, um, and it is it is learning from what we want it to learn. And uh, the only ones who can determine what sort of future we want and what we think is valuable in that future um, is us. AI can tell us what we've done in the past and. Uh, it can be an, an impressive mirror, but it cannot tell us where to go um, and how we should get there. So that's ultimately up, up to us and up to discussions like this, where we can exchange ideas um, and just have a conversation about what do we think is ultimately desirable or not. When we talk about uh, can we trust AI, uh, we can also talk about can we trust people that are creating AI. Because uh, uh, <laughs> at the end, AI cannot be different from their creators. Do we no, know it's true. who has created uh, AI? There are a lot of AIs. So, uh, and from my point of view, uh, uh, AI cannot do nothing wrong because uh, it just uh, is just doing what it was made to do. No, that's that's true, um, and it's. Uh... It's a weak argument to blame an artificial intelligence system because uh, not only has it been made by humans, but there are also humans benefiting from its uh, use. And that's the point I'm making in my research as well, um, that we very eagerly uh, overlook because of this science fiction narrative, um, because that fits these sorts of uh, the, the agenda of these actors. We very easily overlook the organizational dimension of AI that there are people deploying an uh, a artificial intelligence system because it is beneficial, because they can uh, optimize efficiency, because they can optimize profits. And I think it is only fair that the people who are benefiting from the system um, uh, are also shouldering the risks and responsibilities when things go wrong. And it cannot be the case, and that happened in 2008, um, that the people who are reaping the benefits of a system um, cannot be held responsible when things go wrong, that uh, society has to pay for the mistakes uh, others have made while others have profited from these systems when things were good. Um, so that should be, um, I think, more equal, equally distributed and it should be a more just system than that because the result, uh, I'm not saying that because I think it is valuable, the result will be that people don't trust political institutions, that people don't trust the rule of law, um, which will ultimately leads uh, to chaos. So I think if you really want to uphold um, some sort of society or civilization, you really need to make sure that these accountability processes are in place and these trust processes are in place. Um, and that that shouldn't just be about the people who are developing the AI system or the AI itself. It should include the whole ecosystem and being critical of the whole ecosystem in which AI is developed. Yoris, another opinion uh, from Mr. Andre. Yoris, great thinking. Thank you for that. Keep on like that. <laughs> uh, Yoris, uh, can you um, uh, change the slide back uh, when uh, uh, there's a very, very uh, good uh, sentence, AI is power. Sure. Yes, yes. Um, um, at the beginning of the conference, I was talking, uh, and you also, uh, when you started your presentation, 
about predictions uh, about uh, uh, millions of jobs that can be lost or re replaced by uh, uh, AI programs. Uh, uh, magazine Forbes has prediction like uh, uh, 83 million job cuts uh, in uh, two years by uh, 2025. And uh, Goldman Sachs Bank uh, about 300 million uh, job lost uh, in uh, I don't know which time uh, by 2030 or something like this and uh, we don't know if anything from this will happen but uh, they say uh, there's smoke there's fire uh, and uh, at the end it's all about power uh, mm -hmm. if uh, so many jobs are lost uh, and uh, the economy grows then who benefits from it Exactly. And uh, that is um, very much aligned with my point. And the, the, the reason that the message I try to convey is that right now we think of artificial intelligence as either a science fiction story or something of the big tech companies or of the large corporations. Well, when you really look at it and look beyond the surface of uh, mathematics and data, it's all about uh, moral issues and what do we think as a society is the right way to go and how would we feel about certain decisions? What would we uh, choose? What would we think is um, is really beneficial for us as a society? Um, so that's why I said the, the nature of the challenges of AI is not so much technical. It's a moral uh, challenge that we face. How can we come together, uh, have a discussion and consider what we think is worthwhile doing and what's worthwhile not doing. Um, so I think AI should be seen as a source of power and should be questioned as such. Um, and that's not something of uh, governance agencies or just the government or corporations themselves. It's, uh, I think, uh, an obligation for every citizen and a, a form of good citizenship, you could say, to be aware of the use of these systems and be critical of their use, to demand that they are accountable to uh, demand that they can be justified and to uh, question their use. So that's, that shouldn't be up to academics like me um, or professionals or experts. It should be something we are all uh, becoming familiar with and it's something we should all um, do and cultivate um, as, as I said, as, good, as a form of good citizenship, you could say. Um, Doris, uh, can we talk about a few more questions? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, um, let's say, um, I think that we should uh, ask ourselves, are governments working for people? And another question is, uh, are governments in charge? Or are uh, these big companies, big tech companies actually in charge ahead of the uh, government yeah that's a that's a very relevant question and that's what you see now with the antitrust uh regulation also on a european scale um when you had the big railroad tycoons and the big oil tycoons uh, they became so powerful um that the government had to step in and it came up with these antitrust regulations where it just cut up these uh gigantic um firms, corporations into smaller bits, which became more manageable and also from a legal perspective became more manageable. And you hear some people saying that something similar should happen to the big tech uh, companies. And I'm not so sure, but I'm uh, very much interested in the ethical aspects of these um, questions. And for me, it comes down to um, whether we think uh, the economic system markets so to speak, are the best way of providing uh, or guaranteeing the best outcomes of the use of this technology. And I think um, what we've seen is that markets as a mechanism um, don't work as economists uh, thought they would work because all the assumptions for a good use of markets, um, rational actors, uh, free competition, um, it doesn't turn out to be that way in practice. And what you still sense among many of these uh, tech companies is that um, the goal of a, an organization is to make um, profit within uh, the rules of the game. But, and this relates to your question, Martin, um, 
that if they should stick to that, just making profit within the rules of the game, that wouldn't be a problem. But what you see is that uh, a lot of these comp uh, companies, uh, they are trying to change the rules of the game in their favor. Um, and I think that's where it becomes problematic and that's where it becomes undemocratic. Um, so who actually is in charge? That's a, that's a very good question. And how can you, um, as a democracy, get, get back in control, get back in the driving seat? Uh, I don't have a perfect answer, but I think it's really relevant and really pressing and timely to think about these issues uh, now, while AI is still uh, not very broadly adopted, but will be soon. Um, I think we really need to consider these questions now. Uh, great answer. And another great question is here. Uh, what's your thoughts on Microsoft owning OpenAI? Do you think this could be bad in the future? And also, what do you think about the Google's Bard and Bing chat? Do you think they will affect uh, how to develop websites? So there are like two separate uh, mm -hmm. uh, questions. So your thoughts on Microsoft owning OpenAI? Uh, had, that was actually a surprise uh, for most of the people. For it was just like OpenAI and ChatGPT, and then suddenly, uh, Microsoft came out of the bush and said uh, that's actually ours. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, yeah, uh, that's that's two questions, and I can start with the easy one. Do it will will it change um, the building of websites? Uh, definitely, and I've seen, and probably you've seen it as well, uh, the new Chat GPT four function, which is multimodal. Um, and there's this great video where a guy writes an outline for a website on a piece of paper. Um, and it just says uh, a website and it says uh, insert a joke here, um, these sort of things. And he takes a picture of this note um, and he uploads it and shows it to ChatGPT and says, can you build me this website? And ChatGPT not only generates the website, but it also understands that where uh, the box is with write a joke here, it understands that a joke should be placed there. So it doesn't just give you write a joke here. It gives you an actual joke within that box. So already, just based from a, a quick note, somebody drafted uh, in, in 10 seconds time, uh, ChatGPT was able to come up with a functional website and the coding behind it. So yes, that will definitely uh, change it. Now the part for Microsoft becoming an investor of uh, OpenAI, um, I'm not a, a full expert on that, uh, but some of the thoughts I have is that OpenAI once started to make AI work for everyone uh, and for everyone's benefit. They uh, sought to be transparent um, and to really be inclusive in that sense. And I think now that there are more commercial interests involved, um, uh, I'm pretty sure that will change. Um, so I think they will not live up to even their name, OpenAI, uh, because they will have proprietary information that they don't want to share or don't want regulators to scrutinize these sorts of things. So I think it will definitely change it, uh, might change it for the worst, uh, but I'm not sure. I don't know enough about Microsoft and Microsoft plans. I've read that Microsoft fired their AI and ethics team so that is some reason to worry. I know two years ago, Google did the same thing. Uh, Tim Nitgebru, who worked there, uh, who wrote a critical piece on large language models like ChatGPT and the uh, possibility of bias in these models, uh, she was fired as well. Um, so that is not a very hopeful uh, trend or development, but um, I don't know enough to make a, a full and fully informed statement on that. Uh, thank you, uh, Joris. Uh, I will make a statement. Uh, Please do. Gates guy, he appears everything. He's expert for everything. He will save the world. Uh, he will uh, produce uh, a cure for everything. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think uh, he should focus on uh, on his uh, Microsoft and uh, Microsoft is obviously becoming the most powerful company on uh, the planet. Uh, he, Microsoft uh, with open uh, AI is actually a great threat even to Google and uh, we are we are witnessing the clash of Titans uh, uh, which uh, geek will be ruler of the world. <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, 
my personal opinion is that uh, uh, if one person or one company uh, has too much power that always uh, uh, leads to uh, bad results um, and uh, i hope that uh, uh, common sense uh, will um, win uh, so uh, another uh, question is here uh, oh this one is uh, opening even more disturbing uh, thoughts which country is leading in ai usa or china europe is not even a Mention, yeah. a, play, a player in that <laughs> <anymore. option> is. <laughs> um uh, again a difficult question because i don't know enough about state of ai in in china um and i know some of the developments going on in the united states um and i think they are really advanced but i think they develop ai from a different framework value framework you could say and the chinese government is really invested in ai also for uh, you could say for for controlling its population and for uh, making sure the existing regime stays in power um so it, it's I, i'm not sure if you can compare even the forms of ai um but if, if you say which one is technically most advanced i would say the united states but it's uh, a, an informed hunch and uh, not a well-informed uh, opinion on it So China, AI, total control, not a good uh, recipe for the future. So uh, uh, we in Europe, um, uh, we must uh, stand and fight for our human rights. No. I, I fully agree. And I think in Europe um, and also in the United States, uh, we founded our society on the fundamental dignity of each human being that each human being has a worth and um, is worthy of of respect should command our respect um, and this is the basis uh, the basic idea of liberalism that we have the rule of law to protect this basic human worth this basic human dignity um, and to make sure that that cannot be violated and when it is violated that you can hold the violators uh, to account um, and I think this is something that is not just from a moral perspective, uh, a preferable over other forms uh, of governance, uh, but I think it is also, uh, it has shown to be um, scientifically, economically, and just pragmatically um, um, superior to any other form of government. And you're seeing that with Putin in Russia right now, that if you have a autocratic government, uh, people don't dare, dare to speak truth to Putin, which has disastrous results for the way the war is unfolding. Um, so it's not just from a moral perspective that we say it is desirable if we can all make decisions, but it's actually giving you the best outcome and the most informed decision-making processes when you uh, build that on the dignity and human worth of each person. So yeah, that would be a very, very brief response to that. Uh, so, uh, values, it's all about values. I, yeah, I agree. Um, and values are really fuzzy concepts. Um, and uh, I mean, fairness could mean something different to you than to me, and responsibility could mean something different to you than to me. But I think we have these sort of, of fora, these sort of platforms to discuss what we think is a right, uh, meaningful uh, notion or implementation or conceptualization of the word fairness or of the word responsibility and uh, i think if we do that in a deliberative process as we are doing now um, i think we will make steps make progress um, you and i make progress but i think as a society we make progress when we have that conversation um, and engage in these this way of thinking more often and uh, just uh, one wild question that you didn't expect. Is it possible that uh, ancient civilization already had discovered some type of uh, artificial intelligence? I, I saw this great, um, this great cartoon the other day, which um, starts at our current position as humans developing AI. In the next frame, uh, AI has become super powerful and we become slaves to AI. 
And then there is a solar shock, which disrupts the AI system, so we become free. And then we start to worship the sun as our god, um, because it has uh, helped us to get rid of AI. And then the whole story of civilization starts again, uh, and it's sort of a circular story. Um, I, I don't know. It would be wildly speculative to say anything about this, uh, but I think it's an amusing thought. Uh, because uh, this AI uh, developing uh, all around us, uh, in uh, we think about it, uh, and uh, we project this uh, development like... Uh, in future, for next 10, 20 years, uh, it then can be similar to Matrix movie. It's 20 years from the Matrix movie now. And they say always, if you want to predict the future, look at the movies, what they are trying to say to you. I read something really interesting about that um, the other day, and it was about uh, technical imagination. And what is very common, what we're quite good at as human beings is, is to think about how technology might develop all these sort of science fiction scenarios of cars that are able to fly, um, um, these sorts of things. But I read a study, somebody looked into this, uh, the, the sort of uh, technical imagination of the 30s and 40s, the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and what you could see there was a lot of wild speculation uh, the flying cars, as I mentioned, yes. but what we are not so good at predicting is, for example, how uh, social roles will change. So, for example, uh, they came up with a really fancy uh, robot vacuum cleaner, but it was to help the wife. So it didn't expect any emancipation in, on the part of uh, male-female uh, relations. Um, it was basically... Uh, stuck with the old framework that certain people will do certain jobs, pe uh, women will do, will be responsible for the house, um, and it will just extrapolate that towards the future. And even though the technologies become super advanced, we are apparently very bad at predicting how society, social norms, and social relations will change. And I think uh, that is that is really interesting and insightful um, because. We are often thinking about technology, but we should also start to think about how that might affect um, what we value and um, how technology, not just how our values affect the technology we create, but also how the technology we create affects our values, what we think is normal and acceptable, because that will change over time as well. And that is way harder to predict than whether my car will fly in the future or not. Uh. Alex is commenting, thank you for this uh, great webinar. AI is power. So we have uh, struggle power between power and values. That's it, yes. And it's up to each and every one of us to make sure that it goes in the right direction. So it was uh, very interesting. Uh, it was uh, really nice uh, to uh, uh, hear you. Um, uh, thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts uh, with us. Uh, I think that uh, uh, less than 10% uh, of the participants are here uh, live today. So uh, I will uh, next, uh, in, uh, on Monday, I will send, uh, uh, send the record to the rest of the uh, people. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, we will um, uh, achieve our goal that uh, we can embrace uh, artificial intelligence, we can use it uh, for our benefits, uh, but uh, we must uh, make pressure on big tech and on, on governments uh, that uh, the development of artificial intelligence uh, is uh, uh, should be safe, should be safe, and we should we know as a society what we want to achieve with it, so um, uh, that uh, we won't uh, uh, live in a future where just uh, a couple of people will have all the power and uh, the others will have no future. That's a perfect summary. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Joris. Uh, Skol, uh, good night to Denmark. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, to all of uh, um, our guests here. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Yasim uh, has uh, wrote to me, um, an hour ago, that because of that, uh, because the internet didn't work at the 
start of the conference and then the reschedule, etc. Sorry, I will have to go for my prayers. Uh, so best of luck of, to all of you uh, because in Bahrain they have this uh, month of uh, fasting and at the evening they have prayers. Uh, so I hope uh, we will catch uh, up uh, another time with Mr. Uh, Yasin. Uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, it uh, for tonight. I think we have uh, a lot of uh, new uh, uh, thoughts. Thank you very much, Mr. Marco Bohar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joris Krieger. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, for all of uh, you uh, to all of us. Good night.